February 26th, 1935. Room 008, Air Ministry, London. The rain lashed against the tall Georgian windows, its rhythm drowned out only by the droning conversation of military officials gathered around a long oak table. The air was thick with cigarette, smoke and scepticism. At the head of the room stood a man in his early forties, hair slightly dishevelled, spectacles slipping down the bridge of his nose. Robert Watson Watt, a Scottish engineer with the look of someone more accustomed to laboratories than boardrooms. He wasn't supposed to be here. Just weeks earlier, he had been working quietly at the radio research station in Slough, tinkering with wireless frequencies and atmospheric data. Now, under the flickering light of an overhead lamp, he found himself addressing Britain's top air defence strategists. Gentlemen, he began, his voice steady but soft, we may not be able to build a death ray. A few of the uniformed men chuckled, recalling the absurd newspaper stories claiming the air ministry was developing, a weapon that could destroy aircraft with invisible energy beams. Watson Watt adjusted his papers and continued, but what we can build, what we must build, is a system that sees through clouds, fog and night, a way to detect enemy aircraft long before they reach our shores. A silence settled for a moment. Across the table, Air Vice Marshal Hugh, Dowding, a stern, deliberate man with piercing eyes, leaned forward. You're suggesting radio waves could see an aircraft? Yes, Watson Watt replied, pointing to a set of technical diagrams. A transmitter sends out radio pulses. If those pulses strike a metal object, say, an aircraft, they reflect back. Measure the time it takes for the echo to return, and you know how far away the object is. One of the older officers muttered under his breath, Sounds like science fiction. Watson Watt caught it, but pressed on. It's not fiction, sir. The principles are sound. We can prove it. He reached into his briefcase and produced a report, detection and location of aircraft by radio methods, a dense document outlining calculations, field tests, and theoretical models. Dowding took it, flipping through the pages with a frown. Around him, others whispered. The very idea seemed absurd. Invisible waves bouncing off planes miles away, yet Dowding, ever the pragmatist, understood the stakes. He set the report down and looked at Watson Watt. You'll get one test. Prove it works. Outside, the rain intensified, hammering the windows as if in applause or warning. Watson Watt nodded, gathering his notes, heart racing. As he left the air ministry that night, he couldn't shake the mixture of amusement and dismissal he'd seen on those faces. To most of them, he was a dreamer, a man chasing fantasies of invisible waves and ghostly echoes, but in his mind, he could already hear it, the faint, rhythmic pulse of radio signals washing through the air. If he was right, those echoes could one day save Britain, and time was running out. Across the Channel, Adolf Hitler was rebuilding his air force. The Luftwaffe grew stronger with every month. Britain's skies would not stay quiet forever. Watson Watts' test had to succeed. February 26, 1935. Daventry, Northamptonshire. The wind cut across the open field like a blade, carrying with it the damp scent of farmland and iron. A small team of engineers huddled beside a squat transmitter van, its antenna pointed toward the cloudy horizon. Robert Watson Watt stood among them, collar turned up against the chill, eyes fixed on the dials and wires that represented years of theory, condensed into one desperate gamble. This was the test Dowding had authorised, the E. Daventry experiment. If it failed, radar would remain a laughingstock. Miles away, an RAF Handley Page Hayford biplane lumbered through the overcast skies, its twin engines echoing faintly across the countryside. Its mission, 
to fly in a straight line toward the transmitter, carrying a payload of nothing but metal and hope. Inside the van, Watson Watts' assistant, Arnold Wilkins, adjusted the receiver's tuning knob with a gloved hand. Transmitter on, he muttered, voice taut with concentration. Static hissed through the loudspeaker, a harsh, relentless sea of noise. The instruments quivered, needles dancing like nervous fingers. Elevation 1,500 feet came. The radio report from the Hayford dot Watson Watt leaned closer. He had spent sleepless nights calculating how long the reflected waves would take to return, how faint the signal would be, how easily it could be swallowed by atmospheric noise. He wasn't expecting clarity, only proof that something was there. The static roared, then, faintly, a rhythmic fluctuation, a pulse that seemed to rise and fall with the passing aircraft. Wilkins froze. Did you see that? Watson Watt bent over the oscilloscope, heart pounding. There it was again, an unmistakable ripple in the waveform, in perfect sync with the plane's reported position. The air in the van thickened. The noise of the engines grew louder outside and the signal strengthened. It wasn't imagination. It wasn't luck. It was an echo. Watson Watt turned to Wilkins, a slow grin spreading across his face. There it is, Arnold, the aircraft's reflection. We've done it. For a moment, the two men simply stood there, listening to the steady heartbeat of the sky itself. What they were hearing wasn't sound. It was sight, rendered invisible. That evening, as the sun fell behind the hedgerows, Watson Watt drafted his telegram to London. Detection and location of aircraft by radio methods has been demonstrated successfully. At the Air Ministry, Dowding read it twice. He understood immediately what it meant. Britain had just glimpsed the future of warfare, but for now, only a handful of people knew. And while the engineers celebrated with cups of lukewarm tea in a muddy field, German factories across the Rhine were already roaring with activity producing Messerschmitt BF-109s, Heinkels and Junkers bombers. The race for the skies had begun. Watson Watts' invention might have worked, but the question was whether it could be scaled, whether invisible waves could defend an island against the most formidable air force in Europe. He didn't yet know it, but his science fiction would soon form the invisible shield that would stand between Britain and annihilation. Summer, 1938. Bordsey Manor, Suffolk Coast. The sea crashed against the shingle shore as gulls circled overhead, their cries swept away by the wind that rolled off the North Sea. Rising above the dunes, a cluster of tall steel towers reached into the grey sky, silent sentinels of a new age. At their base, a group of engineers in worn RAF uniforms moved among concrete huts filled with humming transmitters and glowing cathode ray tubes. This was Bordsey Manor, the birthplace of Chain Home, Britain's first operational radar network, and the brainchild of Robert Watson Watt. What began as a muddy field test in Daventry had now evolved into a nationwide effort. From the Scottish, Borders to the cliffs of Dover, a line of radar stations, each one bristling with antennas, was being built along Britain's eastern coast. It was a colossal undertaking, and for a time, few understood what these strange towers were even for. Villagers joked that they were part of a secret weather service. Inside one of the coastal bunkers, Watson Watt and his growing team gathered around an oscilloscope. The screen flickered as a faint green trace swept across it, then spiked sharply. Target at 60 miles, said Edward Bowen, a Welsh physicist barely in his twenties, his eyes gleaming. Heading inland. Watson Watt nodded. The signal was crude, fuzzy, but real. Mark it. Cross-check with visual reports from Martlesham Heath. Outside, the sky was empty to the naked eye. But on the radar display, ghostly echoes moved. 
across the screen, proof that radio waves could peer far beyond the horizon. By now, Watson Watt system was being recognized for what it truly was, not a weapon, but a warning. Radar couldn't shoot down bombers, but it could tell the Royal Air Force exactly where to find them. In London, Air Vice Marshal Hugh Dowding, now head of RAF Fighter Command, saw the potential immediately. He ordered a vast network of these, radar sites, each feeding data to regional control centers, where officers plotted aircraft movements on massive boards with colored markers. It was an unprecedented fusion of science and strategy. For the first time in history, a nation could see its enemy coming before the first bomb fell. But time was short. Across the Channel, German airfields were teeming with new squadrons of Heinkel He 111s, Dornier Doe 17s and Messerschmitt fighters, aerial wolves sharpening their claws. In Bordsey, Watson Watt often worked deep into the night. The hum of the E equipment, the glow of the vacuum tubes, it all blended into a hypnotic rhythm. He knew that every improvement in range, every refinement in detection speed, might one day mean thousands of lives saved. Still, not everyone was convinced. Some commanders scoffed at the cost and complexity of the system. Others questioned whether radar could truly operate in combat conditions. Watson Watt responded the only way he knew how, by demonstrating results. When a test flight of RAF bombers attempted to approach the coast unannounced, every one of them was detected long before their engines could be heard. Dowding smiled grimly when he received the report. It works then, he said. Let's build the rest. By the time 1939 dawned, chain home stretched like an invisible fence across Britain's coastline, a linked chain of eyes scanning the skies day and night, and just in time. That September, Germany invaded Poland, Britain declared war. Within months, Watson Watt's impossible invention would face its first true test. The skies of Europe were darkening, and soon Britain would be fighting for its very survival. August 15, 1940, the English Channel. The dawn broke blood orange over the water, the air trembling with the distant roar of engines. Dozens, no, hundreds, of dark specks dotted the horizon, swelling larger by the second. It was the Luftwaffe, Operation. Sea Eagle in full motion, throwing everything it had against Britain's defences. From the cliffs of Kent to the fields of Sussex, the coastal radar towers of Chain Home buzzed to life. Their tall latticed frames caught the rising sun, steel, glowing like the bones of some colossal beast. Inside the operations huts, airwomen and radar technicians watched glowing green screens with tense precision. Plot 50 aircraft, bearing 075 degrees, range 80 miles and closing fast. At Bentley Priory, the nerve centre of fighter, command... The message was relayed instantly through the Dowding system. Telephones rang, markers slid across massive plotting tables, and squadrons were scrambled from bases across southern England. Watson Watts' invention, once mocked as science fiction, was now Britain's invisible shield. In the underground, control room, a young women's auxiliary air force, WAF, officer, moved a red counter across a map. Raid approaching Dover, sir. Air Chief Marshal Hugh Dowding, composed as ever, stood watching from the balcony above. Scramble Biggin Hill, tell them Angels 15. Outside, engines screamed to life. Supermarine Spitfires and Hawker Hurricanes roared down runways, lifting into the summer sky. Their pilots, many barely out of school, climbed through clouds already streaked with contrails. And because of radar, they were climbing to meet the enemy head-on. At the radar hut in Fornes, a technician glanced up from her scope. They've... Split formation, sir. Two waves now. Send word to Group 11. They're trying to flank us. 
Far above, in the thin air over Kent, the battle erupted. Tracers tore through the sky, shells bursting among twisting aircraft. The sound was a physical thing, thunder and tearing fabric, engines screaming in agony. From his office in London, Robert Watson Watt listened to the reports as they came in, one after another, RAF fighters intercepting enemy bombers before they reached their targets. The system was working. The invisible web of radar signals was guiding Britain's defenders with uncanny accuracy. Without it, Dowding's limited fighter strength would have been overwhelmed in hours. With it, every British squadron was where it needed to be, when it needed to be there. Day after day, the pattern repeated. The Luftwaffe attacked, the radar spotted them, the RAF struck. German pilots were stunned. How did the British always seem to know where they were coming from? In Berlin, Hermann Göring raged. There must be spies in every village, he shouted, slamming his fist on the table. He never suspected the truth, that the spies were waves of radio energy bouncing invisibly through the clouds. By early September, the outcome was clear. The RAF was bloodied, but unbroken. The invasion Hitler had planned, Operation Sea Lion, was indefinitely postponed. Britain still stood, and in the quiet after the storm, Watson Watt finally allowed himself to exhale. He had fought no battles, fired no bullets, yet his creation had shaped the war's outcome. A weapon not of destruction, but of perception. Years later, when asked what he felt during those days, he would smile modestly and say, We just gave our pilots the advantage of a few extra minutes. They did the rest. But in those few minutes lay the fate of a nation. From laughter in a smoky boardroom to victory in the skies, Robert Watson Watt's impossible idea had proven that the Future belongs to those who can see what others cannot.